Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Amen. These words of greeting that I offer to you today are an echo of the opening words of the book of Revelation. This promise that John gives that in Christ God holds all things together. What a blessed assurance in the midst of a world that is at times feeling chaotic to us. What a blessed assurance for us to hear this word in our own lives and its ups and downs, joys and challenges. The one who is, who was, and who is to come holds all of this world together. Revelation is at its heart a book of hope. Hope that anchors us in the stormy seas of life. Hope that pushes us forward when our hearts could easily be broken. Hope that carries us into the uncertainties of the future. Hope that reminds us that we are forgiven and live in grace each day. And a hope that comforts us in times of anxiety, worry, concern, and fear. It is this hope that we want to lift up in these next five weeks together as we walk through this book of Revelation. And I hope you're excited about this journey we will share together. Now for most people, you say the book of Revelation and they start to shake in fear because all they think about are perhaps movies or books or, or prophetic preaching they have heard that speaks of the end of times and it is scary in these interpretations. But underneath it all, we hope to lift up that message of God who holds all of this together, past, present, and future. And in that is a great gift for us as we read more thoroughly this great gift at the end of the New Testament, this book of Revelation. And I hope you always hear that echo of the one who is, who was, who is to come. It reminds me of a story of the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. He was new to a congregation, and so as is when you're the new pastor, people introduce, you, uh, introduce themselves to you. Oftentimes, people will share their family with you, and this happened for him too. He met lots of new people that he'd now be serving in his congregation. Sometimes people shared with him their role in the congregation. They served on a board or a committee. They taught Sunday school. Well, one gentleman approached the new pastor, Pastor Curry, and said to him, uh, Pastor, you need to know that I'm on the B team. Well, Pastor Curry said, I guess I'm not familiar with the B team. Uh, maybe it's unique to your congregation. Tell me about this B team. Well, he said, Pastor, the B team is this. I be before you got here. I be while you are here. And I be here long after you're gone. <laughs> and so it is with the church. We continue to be one generation in the midst of many. The early church we'll read about in Revelation, the church of today, and we believe there is a church of tomorrow, the church of the future. Revelation has a word for us all. So let's get into it. Revelation begins by introducing us to John, the writer. Now, there is some biblical uh, debate over who John is, his identity. Is he the same John who wrote the Gospel of John, the Acts of the Apostles? Is he the same John as who wrote the three letters that are included in the New Testament? Or is he a part of the Johannine community, a community who is raised in a theological line of thinking with the writer of the book of John? Well, Maybe the debate continues, but what we do know for certain is that this book has authority and it has a place in the canon, in the whole Bible, and particularly in the New Testament. It serves as an important form of literature in the New Testament, unique in many ways. It is apocalyptic literature. In a nutshell, apocalyptic literature speaks to a suffering generation, a generation experiencing persecution of some great kind, and they are looking for imminent blessing to come. So this apocalyptic book does speak very directly to the persecution of its time and does offer, as I mentioned earlier, this great word of hope. Oftentimes, 
Revelation is misinterpreted because it forgets all of the important language that needs to be unpacked or understood for this context. Reading Revelation can sometimes feel like when you go to a Shakespearean uh, play or read a Shakespeare uh, piece of literature and you sort of have to get into the language before you can understand it. The same is true here. It's important for us to enter into the language of Revelation in order to understand it fully. So John shares with the church a dream, a vision that he has. Notice that Revelation does not have an S at the end of it. It is one revelation, not many revelations, one revelation with lots of details in the midst of it. So John shares this vision he has of the risen Lord. This vision takes time for us to understand fully today as we hear it spoken in these opening chapters. But this one revelation will reveal to us the overarching promise that Jesus' own self is this revelation for us in all times and all places. This is one that we must enter into like, like a dream in some ways. Have you ever had a dream? In the night you wake up and perhaps you nudge your husband or wife and say, you wouldn't believe what I just dreamt. And you share perhaps the images or the stories or the pieces from your day that were included. I think we've all had experiences of that. Maybe we called a friend in the morning or maybe we wrote it down and later we tried to interpret what that dream meant. Or maybe that dream gave us some kind of comfort or helped us to sort through something that had caused us struggle. This past Monday night, our blind ministry group gathered again, our outreach group, and we went into our Bible study, which was centered around the beginning of Revelation, and we talked about dreams, and two members of the group shared their experience of powerful dreams where they not only received comfort, but also a sense of encountering the risen Lord. It was a powerful time of sharing. One had been in the hospital and had dreamed of, of a, a vision that helped her be assured that things would be okay. And another had a dream of searching for faith and then looking up to see Jesus' own self extending a hand to her. I believe that Jesus continues to speak to us in a variety of ways, including our own dreams and visions. But this dream, this vision, this revelation in this book of Revelation helps us to understand something new that is happening for the church and for us in this time. I offer this artist's rendition of uh, Revelation. It is a woodcut from the 18th century, and as you can see, it is filled with details. But so is the first part of this reading today. John describes his vision of the Son of Man, the risen Lord, Jesus' own self. And what he sees is this vision of a man clothed in white with even hair that is as white as snow. And then we get into all the details of what he sees in this encounter with the Son of Man. First, he describes that in his right hand are seven stars. And later he will explain that these seven stars are the seven angels with messages to deliver to the seven churches. We can do our own interpretation and think about stars and light and how this message would then be light to illuminate something for the church to take note of. And then we concentrate on what he sees around the face of the Son of Man. Not only does he see a sword, a two-edged sword coming from Jesus' mouth, and again a reminder of us of the power of God's word as sharp as a two-edged sword, but also how his, his face is lit up, and so you see rays coming off of the face in this artist's description. You see rays emanating from the face of the risen Lord, and then what look like overgrown eyebrows are actually the flames of fire that he sees in the eyes of the risen Lord. 
And then we are reminded that this vision is so great that John has fallen to his knees and placed his face down because it is so overwhelming. And I would be frightened too or overwhelmed by such a vision. Around him are seven lampstands. And we understand later those are the seven churches, the message that they will receive. And John, even in his fear, hears directly from God's own self in Jesus, the risen Lord, do not be afraid. Even in this glorious moment, the first word spoken is do not be afraid. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. Here is that powerful undergirding word again given to John in the beginning of this revelation. Just as in this picture, there are so many details to uh, unpack, to take note of, and sometimes that can be difficult for us. And yet at the same time, they will be rich and renew our understanding of what's happening in the book of Revelation. All of these details help us then to understand more fully what John's vision is all about. Oftentimes, apocalyptic books do not lift up an author or a context, but Revelation is unique in the sense that we know it is John, and we know the time and the place in which he is addressing, the, the geographical location, for instance. Here's a map that I hope helps you visualize where it is that the book of Revelation originates. John says he writes it off of the island of Patmos, and we see that as off what is modern-day Turkey. And all of these seven churches are located in, great, in close proximity to one another and to where John receives this vision. It's helpful for us to see where that is in our world today, but at the same time when we hear much news coming out of the land of Turkey, we know it is a very different context in our time as opposed to this time. And so we will be attentive in these coming weeks to what is happening in the political scene of the time. What is happening with the economical scene? What is happening in the spiritual lives of those living in this time? And what does it mean to live in this part of the world? And what we get to do today is then read the Gmail that is sent to these seven churches. On that island of Patmos, he will receive these messages to share now, by Gmail, of course, I don't mean what we log into on our computer, but we're talking Gmail, folks, God mail. And today, we get to listen in on what is being spoken. I'm going to invite Cindy forward again, our lector, to share with me and with you uh, what this Gmail says to the seven churches. Today, we heard just the first message, the one written to Ephesus, but I want you to get a sense of all seven messages, at least briefly summarized in this reading. There'll be parts for you, so watch the screens, as well as parts for Cindy and I to read together. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Church of Smyrna, I know your affliction and your poverty even though you are rich. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Beware, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you may be tested. Church of Pergamum, I have a few things against you. There are some who follow the teachings of Balaam so that they eat food sacrificed to idols and practice fornication. Repent. 
Church of Thyatira, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who teaches others to eat food sacrificed to idols. I give her time to repent, but she refuses. Church of Philadelphia, I know you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have. Church of Laodicea, you say I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Repent. Listen, I am standing at the door and knocking. Let anyone who has an ear now listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So to recap, what is going on in these seven churches? One church is keeping the rules but has forgotten to show love. Another church knows that suffering is coming but is, is encouraged to not fear that suffering to come. Three churches are called to direct repentance based on the worship of false gods. Another church is given a wake-up call for they are stuck in spiritual lethargy. They are stuck in a place that is not allowing them to live out the good news. One church is encouraged to not lose heart, to hang in there because they are faithful. And another church must be an awfully big place so much so that they have become an island unto themselves and they have forgotten what it means to reach out and connect and be a part of the larger church of Christ. So I read this Gmail this morning. Well, I think the key is that last word we heard. Let anyone who has ears now listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. The church is not a perfect place. We know that. It never has been. It, no, it is not now, and it never will be. And yet, Christ still works through this church with all its imperfections. And if we hear all of those different messages, we can either think of congregations that are struggling in those places, or we may even identify our own selves as a congregation. As I hear this word, I am reminded it is a church, it is a message for all of the church, for us to be mindful of the needs of one another. Some of you know that on my sabbatical, I spent time worshiping in other congregations. I specifically tried to choose churches that were not a part of the ELCA, but other Christian congregations here in Rochester. And I was encouraged by the great spirit at work in all of these places. They all have their struggles too, but as a community of faith, I was uplifted in times of worship with them. I was encouraged to worship in different ways that were new to me, and I was reminded how we each have an important function right here in this community. We are, are a greater body of Christ because of what we offer to one another. And I was reminded that Bethel could easily become an island unto our own selves. And at times we are called to repent of this tendency, but I am grateful for the ways we seek to be faithful as a congregation to the community. This very Tuesday night, we will open up our doors and our, our outdoor space to this neighborhood around us and be reminding again those that, that perhaps live right next door that we are a place that is welcoming to them too, and we hope to come to them with hospitality and kindness as well. And I'm encouraged by a group of young people who, at this very moment, are worshiping in a place that is our connected brother and sister in Christ, this congregation in Puerto Rico that we share this great ministry with. Different language, different context, different political and social situation, and yet we are joined together in this one body. And I am encouraged by the ways that you share the gospel in your context, in your workplace, in your schools, in your home, among your friendships, the ways in which you seek to live out this grace, called again and again to repent, but then called again and again to seek ways to share the good news of hope with others. Stay tuned in these next weeks together. For what you will discover is that the language that you use is oftentimes taken 
from revelation. Oftentimes the words that we have found to be so meaningful in scripture and in song come right out of this important book of hope. And remember in each day that it is this one God who is, who was, who is to come, who holds all of this world together. Amen. Please rise.